name is Danny Watt, and I am the instructor of trombone and euphonium at the University of Wyoming. Prior to joining the faculty at UW, I taught middle school and high school for four years, and today I'm going to talk to you about my approach and methods that I've learned to be the most effective. The overall theme I want to accomplish when I teach is to make everything immediately tangible. Understand that when we are learning any new skill, there is a lot of new information and a lot of tricky new motions involved, so I find it best to keep the information as simple as possible. Especially for brand new beginners, I've found that it's incredibly important that students have instant comprehension so they don't become frustrated and overwhelmed. So I'd like to begin the process by asking you a seemingly unrelated question. Do you know how to drive a car? Why would you want to learn how to drive a car? And what are the two most important things in a car? Meaning that if you don't have either of these, you're not going anywhere. These are especially fun questions to ask fifth or sixth grade students to see what they come up with. So the two most important things are you need gas and you need an engine. with gas being the absolute most important. You can have the world's most powerful engine, but if you don't fill up your car with fuel, you're not going anywhere. Now, why do I ask this question? Because our instruments become our musical vehicles, and when we learn how to drive them, they too will take us places. In order to drive, they also require gas and an engine. On our brass instruments, our fuel is going to be our air, and our engine is going to be our embouchure that responds to that fuel source. <sniffs> With beginning students, I like to see if we can get our engine running on the mouthpiece alone. To start, I'll have them simply say the word mom, and then leave their mouth in the position at the end of the word and place the mouthpiece on top. Mom. So they can kind of feel how their embouchure is supposed to be formed. Then I'll ask them to take in a big breath and see if they can move fuel through the engine to see if they can get it running. Mom. Then I'll give them a couple examples. Which engine do you think sounds more efficient? This? Or this? And why? The better example is because I used a higher uh, level of octane fuel for my engine. If the student's engine sounds like this, it's because their engine is too tight, so I ask them to loosen that up. If their engine sounds like this, then their engine is too loose, and I'll ask them to tighten that up a little bit. Now that the student knows how to make the car run, let's break down the approaches to both components, starting with air. Now, air only knows how to do five things. I gave you the first one, start then the opposite of that would be stop. The air knows how to increase, therefore it also knows how to decrease. And the last one is sustain or stay the same. That's it. That's truly all the air needs to do to make music. Already you can see that these five things will dictate every aspect of every note, including rhythmic duration, dynamic, and overall shape. Since we can control the notes from the input of the air, let's talk about the air spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, we have sustained air, or as I call it, glist air. This is where the air remains absolutely constant as you change notes. You'll see how this is useful when slurring. On the other end of the spectrum, we have separated notes, or as I call them, individual air events. This is where every single note gets its own burst of that premium fuel that does not share air with any of the other notes around it. You'll see how this will come in handy when playing shorter or staccato notes. Now let's talk about the role of the engine and how the engine is responsible for creating the actual sound and pitch. Remember that the engine responds directly to the air input and learns gears or different pitch from the quality fuel. So always keep the air still the most important. Before we start working on playing different notes, I ask all of my students, is it okay to miss notes? The answer is absolutely yes, because we're learning. 
Mistakes are not only inevitable, but necessary in the learning process. By establishing early on with the students that mistakes will not be judged negatively, you hopefully establish an environment conducive to learning rather than fear. So let's begin learning how to play different pitches by climbing the stairs. I draw a set of stairs with the different pitches that visually represent their relationship to one another. Low notes need a lower gear and higher notes need a faster gear. As we ascend, each note requires slightly tighter lips and slightly faster air. As we descend, they need slightly slower air and slightly looser lips. Although this approach is technically not true, when in reality only the embouchure is responsible for creating pitch, the faster air in particular helps encourage the student to keep the air moving as they ascend. Similarly, in brass playing, we want to avoid the word tighter, but in these early stages, they need to understand that the engine does need to be in a faster gear in order to play higher notes. This terminology helps the students understand quickly in a tangible way. By using stairs to show the steps between notes, they'll later understand the intervallic relationship between half steps and whole steps. When students are beginning to expand their range, this visual keeps these new notes in perspective. So if this was our newer note, as opposed to this being at the top of their range, is this new note a lot higher than what they can already play? No, it's just one step, right? So what does it need? It needs faster air and tighter lips. Now, is it a lot faster air and a lot tighter lips? No, just a little. Let's now talk about introducing articulation as well as working to become much more consistent and accurate by aiming for these notes. I'll draw a birthday cake and ask everybody to blow out all the candles. Good. Now, can everybody say the word two? Now, instead of saying two, can you combine blowing out the candles while saying the word two? Now, what if I asked you to aim for just this candle down here? Let's all blow out just this one candle. Did you aim? Did you hit it? What about this candle? What does this candle need? Does it need slightly faster air and slightly tighter lips? Let's blow out just this candle. Now, what about this one? Does it need even faster air and tighter lips? What if I were to draw a bullseye on it to help us aim? Aim just for that candle. By encouraging the students to aim for a particular bullseye, especially in the upper register, you encourage the students to be much more deliberate and intentional before they even play the note, and they will find much more success. Let's talk about a very effective sequential practice approach that works well for individuals as they're practicing by themselves, but also works well in the full ensemble. Step one, we start with establishing our air. Start here to establish the quality input with having to worry about all the mechanics necessary to manipulate the instrument. Let's face it, there is so much you have to do in order to get this thing right, but if your input isn't doing its job, not much else will matter. So make sure you're aiming for bullseyes with your premium air. I'll demonstrate this whole process on the tune Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, just the first couple bars. This is particularly good because just the first couple notes require you to aim for these larger intervals. Second step. Now that your air is set, let's see if we can coordinate the, all these tricky movements exactly in sync with the air, all the while striving to keep that air the exact same as you did in the first step. And then the final step is put those together and play. But wait, is it okay to miss notes? You'll notice that I used on our air spectrum individual air events. But what if I were to slur them and I used glist air? What would that look like? Step one. Step two.
Step three. What if I were to use a combination of our glist air and our individual air vents? How about... It's easy for students to look at whatever he or she is working on and get overwhelmed. That's why I encourage them not to work on the whole puzzle at first, but just one small piece at a time. This is what I call puzzle piece practicing. Get this one tiny measure correct all by itself, and then get the next one correct all by itself. Once you feel comfortable with both of these, then you can start putting these two together. This is a simple approach that, again, encourages students to make a challenging task much easier and sequential. So in the case of our tune, I already worked on the first puzzle piece of Twinkle. I'm going to practice the second piece. Now that I feel comfortable with those, I can put those two puzzle pieces together. I hope these concepts have proven immediately tangible to you. And remember that as you teach, keep it simple, keep it easy. This way, you're equipping your students to take on all future challenges by giving them consistent tools and understanding from the very beginning that through patience and diligence, they can always rely upon to find success. Uh -huh.